Stove Leg Media, igniting conversation. This is True Crime Cast. Jamie, as always, with John. What is up? Dude, I'm excited about this episode. So uh I guess what is up is excitement. Yeah, levels. got a little more of a little more of a mystery. Little uh what really went down and what happened with this wild situation. And there's a fa- lot. One of my favorite episodes was talking about the Amityville horror because yep. one, it was an actual crime, but two there was mystery, intrigue, and possible ghosts. I love some intrigue, man. Yeah. So that's what we're... Those three things are here as well. And I, I don't know. I I have some theories. There may be some crime involved, but we'll get to that later. Fair enough. I want to thank some people for submitting reviews. And I'm going to read several here as we are wrapping up our contest for March so that people uh, can be eligible to win our contest. We will announce those winners next week, but want to acknowledge these reviews before we go. This comes from Liz over on Spotify. I just recently started listening to the, this podcast on a regular basis, and I really appreciate John and Jamie. Now, they're always objective. Y'all are great. Anytime you can use y'all in a review, I, I highly, highly recommend all the y'alls. This comes from Tom Randall over on Spotify. The best podcast I've found and the first show I listened to. I've been listening for years. I think it gets better every episode. It's like listening to a couple of your buddies tell a story. I think that's the vibe we're going for. So thank you to Tom. This is over on Apple Podcasts from Canada. This comes from Eoli W7. I'm sure that's not right, but it's close. E-O-L-I W7 says, Jamie and John are incredibly sensitive when discussing difficult content and treat victims with the utmost respect. I appreciate the mix of classic cases and also current cases with calls to action. Plus, their voices are quite soothing. My wife would disagree. Mine as well. We'll continue listening for years to come. Thank you so much. This comes from Megan TD, like T-E-E-D-E-E. So T-D. T-D. <laughs> Love to hear John and Jamie's takes on cases. I appreciate how they focus on victims and don't glamorize perpetrators. I also like the banter they share. Highly recommend. And one more here over on Apple Podcasts. And that comes from JBus7. I love this podcast. Typically, I listen on Spotify. I started listening to it when I was working on my BSW a few years ago. And remember being excited to learn that John was a social worker and Jamie has had foster kids. I love the dynamic between John and Jamie and the respective way they talk about the cases they cover. I think it's great that they take time to process the information and explore it and not just in the sensationalized way that a lot of other podcasters talk about crimes. It's clear just by listening the amount of empathy and respect the guys have for the individuals they are discussing. I've recently started listening to their other podcasts, Bless Their Hearts, and feel like I'm hanging out with old friends but I guess I should save this for a review of that podcast. Great call. Thanks, guys, for a true crime podcast that is informative and interesting without being gratuitous. Those are a lot of big words. A lot and of big words, a lot of reviews. We had a great turnout for this contest, so we're excited. Again, next week we'll announce our five winners and what they've won and uh, work on getting those to you individually, those prizes. We're excited. Speaking of bless their hearts, all those just really blessed my heart. Like, I don't know. Today, uh, the weather's changing in Kentucky. You can hear my voice already starting to suffer the, from that consequence. But, uh, yeah, that made my day. Yeah, it was uh, very heartwarming. So really, really appreciate that. Bless your hearts. Yeah, man. Um, got some folks I want to thank over on Patreon. We have Lisa who came in at the $3 a month level, but took advantage of the 15% discount when you join an annual membership. And Lisa, we appreciate you. You've been a fan for as long as I can remember. So always thankful that you've been a part of Patreon and took advantage of that 15% discount. And also we have Kyle who did the same thing, $3 a month, but did an annual membership and saved 15%. Yesterday we dropped an episode about Ruby Frank, yeah, and I one. had no idea who this woman was, 
but it is interesting. It's a hot topic. If you want our opinion, it is only available on the Patreon. So it's over there and it is wild. It is wild. And uh, you had the review about the social worker and uh, in me and, and social worker John came out. So that was fun. I it felt like good. I was at work. I put you on the spot. Sorry about that. No, it was fine. It was, it was a, it's a really interesting case and it does involve child abuse, uh, spoiler alert, but Jamie gets uncomfortable. So, uh, he got really uncomfortable. So go check it out. Yep. Still a little uncomfortable for that. And John, you know how much I hate a do. So without further ado, why don't you get us rolling? I didn't know you hated the do. I, don't know, I, was, I just came up with well, that. I don't. Anyway, we're going to go to San Jose, California. Jamie, you're going to LA this summer. I do you am. have any plans to swing by the old San Jose? Don't, I don't know geographically where they yeah, are. I, don't, I, I haven't looked up any uh, activities in San Jose that we're planning on visiting. So well, you, there we you are. Uh, definitely should put it on your to-do list because the locals there have probably mentioned the Winchester Mystery House. This is fascinating. I've known about this for years, and I'm so glad we get to talk about it. So this mansion, it is it is interesting for sure. It's a Victorian Gothic mansion. And it is right smack dab in the center of the busiest area of San Jose. It was built in 1886, and when it was purchased, it was a modest eight-room farmhouse, and it sat on 45 acres. Sarah Winchester was the widow who had inherited the fortune of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company. Winchester has made weapons for over a century, and... They got extremely wealthy because of these inventions, and they're still being sold today. And it is reported that $20 million inheritance and half the ownership of the firearms business went to her when her husband passed away. And that allowed her to buy this small ranch house. And many believe that she did it as a way to escape the spirits of those that were killed by the Winchester rifle. They also had just a lot of a lot of death that kind of followed them around with with infants passing away, with people dying young. So she was doing whatever she could to avoid being the next uh, early death. I think she was being desperate and trying to preserve her own life, which I think most of us would do. Her husband, her infant, and her parents had all died, so she moved out to. California on her own. And it was kind of surprised to people. The, and these losses all took place within just a span of less than a year. Like it was boom, boom, boom. And there were others in there too. There was um, brothers and brother-in-laws, father-in-laws. I mean, it was tragedy. Nieces, nephews. Yes. Yeah. Tragedy after tragedy for Sarah. And just to talk a little bit more about Winchester, this is a very popular uh, gun manufacturing company. They really took off and they started with repeating rifles. So basically that makes it a semi-automatic or even a, a, a weapon that you don't have to completely load back up with gunpowder and everything else. You can shoot it, cock it, shoot it again. Not, we're not, they're not making Uzis out there in 1896. And remember, I, 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 don't, I don't, I know people don't want to talk a lot about guns, but it's, it is something interesting to me. You got to remember the time frame we're talking about. So this is right after the Civil War when we were still using musket balls that you had to pour the powder in your your rifle, then you had to pack the the ammunition in, then you had to it was it took like a minute to reload a firearm. Oh yeah, if you're doing it well. So when you're talking about a weapon that you can fire multiple rounds simply by pulling the trigger over and over, it was completely revolutionary to the firearms business. People were moving west in in rapid pace and this really helped them to be able to uh, defend themselves as they were trekking out into unknown territory. Did it result in a lot of deaths? Of course. And that's kind of what she felt like she was haunted by. Within a few months, she had already added more than a dozen rooms onto her new home with the intention on letting some family members come and live with her, especially her sisters. And again, this started out with eight rooms and she's already doubled that within a few years. And at this point she's living alone. She does have some servants that are around, but John, I I don't know how many actual rooms are in my house. I should probably know that, but like six people live in my house and we're good. I don't need 20 rooms. This seems like excessive, right? 
I, w- I mean, I think we counted up the number of doors in our houses for the Bless Their Hearts episode oh, about yeah. the wheels and doors. Oh, yeah. And surprisingly, a lot more doors in my house than I thought. But most of them are closet, <laughs> right, <laughs> closet right. doors. We're talking about actual rooms here. For the 38 years after she moved in, the home was constantly under construction. We redid some things to my home a few years ago, and those four months were the longest four months ever. I can't imagine it happening for 38 years. And today, tourists can go out and see this house, which is now 24,000 square feet. A typical house in our area is probably somewhere around 2,000 square feet. Yeah, so that's a good size home. 12 times the size of an average home where we are. And there are 2,000 doors at their house. Okay. Probably more than wheels there, I would think. That's 100 times more than my doors, right? Is, I is think that so. Right, math? Yeah. Mm. Some of them open to blank walls. Some of them open to big drop-offs. And it's like a maze. There are 10,000 windows Some are built into the floor and ceiling. 47 fireplaces. It's a lot of fire. 17 chimneys. I would think there would be more chimneys. That's a skewed number, isn't it? I think you have uh, (laughs) as many chimneys or closer to the amount of fireplaces. No one's going to be surprised when we tell you the place burnt down. Yeah, right. (laughs) It's kidding. It doesn't. 40 stairways. And there was at least one that just led to a ceiling and nothing else. 40 bedrooms, two ballrooms, 13 bathrooms, six kitchens, three elevators, two basements, one large wood paneled dining room and a partridge and a pear tree. Construction reportedly came to around $5 million. And you mentioned that she inherited 20 million. Think about that 130 years ago, insane amount of money. If you move that forward she spent about a quarter of her fortune upgrading the home, and now that would be about $71 million of construction on this house. I know I just saw that LeBron James bought a mansion in L.A. that was like $34 million. So this is twice as big as that, or That's twice crazy. as much money as that at least. That's wild. You know, I used to do construction back in the day. I don't know if you knew that or not, but apparently she would – come in, have a plan and have her construction workers work on this project. And then halfway through, she would be like, no, stop, tear it all down and do it again. Start over. We're doing this differently. Like, I can't believe that she was able to uh, keep contractors, but at the same time, they could pretty much name their price. So you could spend your entire career working for this woman, just building random crap. And it was constant work. Like, sure, she's asking you to start over, but you're still getting paid for your labor. So you're making money. It's like a never-ending contract that you just continue to rake the money in for. This house even got as tall as seven stories tall. But there was an earthquake in 1906 that brought it down a few levels. So after the earthquake, Sarah stopped working on the front wing of the home. It just kind of stayed like in a bad shape for, yeah. for years. And it was spared a lot of damage because it was actually built on a floating foundation, which was, I mean, had to be revolutionary for the time. But basically, this is a design that lets the structure move freely because it's only semi-attached to the base, which is great for places with earthquakes like California. (laughs) But it also sounds like, educate me here, because that sounds like it's more susceptible to just falling down. Like, if it's not attached, like... I know anytime somebody gets a crack in their foundation, they freak out. This is a floating foundation. It doesn't sound great. Yeah. I I mean, I think it's fine. I mean, the house is still there. I I mean, (laughs) so obviously I'm wrong, but I just don't know how I'm wrong. Yeah. I I don't know the full physics behind it, but I don't know. I I don't think it's just not very secure. I think it's just uh, secured in a way that will lend itself to surviving earthquakes. Fair enough. Okay, which it should be in that area probably. So good call. So the community, of course, began to talk about the rich woman in the giant home. And according to the town rumors, Sarah was led to build the weird home because a medium told her that the ghost of those who were killed by the Winchester rifle would haunt her until the day she died unless she went out west to build a home with room for all of them. I don't take financial advice from pretty much anybody, but let alone a medium. (laughs) So if that's true, I think that's where your crime comes in. Lying to somebody to get them to spend that type of money. Now, I don't know what the medium was paid and what their agreement was, but it certainly sounds shady 
And I heard that she was told, yes, to, to build a room for them or to build a house big enough for all the ghosts, which I don't get in the first place. But her odd construction, some believe it was to confuse the ghosts or to keep them like guessing, to put them in kind of a maze so they would leave her alone. If ghosts are smart enough to tell you to build a house for them, are they dumb enough to fall for a staircase that goes to nowhere? And if so, if they live there, they'd figure it out, right? Like the whole thing is just odd. We'll talk more about it in a minute, but I mean, there were there were doors that would lead to just like really long hallways, which would then come to another door. And when you opened it, it would be like an eight foot drop into the, like from the ceiling of a room. Like you would be at the ceiling of another room and drop down eight feet to the floor. Break both your legs if you so, weren't paying attention. Like, could you maybe like, die? Have you ever just woke up in the middle of the night and needed water and you like, you try your best to remember your way, but then something will surprise you. Like, could you imagine falling eight feet because you went down the wrong room or wrong hallway? No, I, I would want no part. Of, I think I would just lock myself in my bedroom at night. So I wouldn't do that. And she would come out later and say that she was being haunted in Connecticut. So this was not a new thing for her. The medium didn't introduce this idea, but she was trying to get away from those spirits and when she was in Connecticut, she would sleep in a different bedroom each night to try to avoid being haunted. Some people in town said that Sarah believed that if the construction ever ended, she would die. And again, with the self-preservation, I'm not sure how you would wind up believing something like that to be true, but to believe that as long as I'm working on my house, I have a purpose and I'll live. It's it's super odd. Like it's a mental process that I can not wrap my mind around what's odd is the one time she did take some time off she got really sick during that time and yeah. she stuck she started working again and got better yeah <laughs> so, so it's wild it's like it convinced her that this was really happening we're going to dive more into her specific story and the life of sarah winchester and the house after the break communicated via text don't tell them it's a wrong number have some fun with it play along you don't know who you have really been messing with why would you have a duffel bag full of cash you're not so big and bad when you're not behind your phone next time you may not make it out alive you don't work here stop nick freeze drop the bag and get on the ground one thing at a time. First, the cash. You know you're not the only option I have, right? You're behind this whole thing, aren't you? No, this this wasn't supposed to happen. It's over for you. No, 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 no. Why is this happening? From the makers of True Crime Cast, find the fictional mystery Left on Dead wherever you find your favorite podcasts. So, yeah, Sarah Winchester, she was born in 1839 in New Haven, Connecticut, and she grew up in a world of privilege, something that I will never understand right. from the trailer parks of Jellicoe, Tennessee. She spoke four languages, which is absurd. And, of course, because of her privilege, she was able to go to the best of the best when it came to schools. In 1862, she married a man named William Wirt Winchester, which is just the best name. Yeah, Wirt is the most pretentious middle name I've heard. I don't, yeah, I don't think I've ever heard that middle name before, but I agree. I mean, I did when you just said it, but. William was the only son of Oliver Winchester, who was the founder of Winchester Repeating Arms Company. And four years later, after they got married, Sarah gave birth to their daughter, Annie, and she gave birth on July 12th, 1866. This was a child that was very much like it was their heart's desire. Right. They had they had family members who had gotten married before them who had already had like growing families. So this is something that they really wanted. And tragic tragedy struck. This baby died just a few weeks after the birth because of a condition that didn't allow the baby to absorb nutrients that she needed from the mother's milk. So basically it died of malnutrition and you know 
I, I can't imagine the pain that you experience when you go through something like this. And it was so, so hard on them. They didn't want to have any more children. And I think that's pretty common for people that lose, uh, lose a baby, especially if it's their first one. And oftentimes it'll drive people apart. That's a tragedy that I don't think anybody can ever be prepared for and fully heal from. And, and they certainly didn't. A little over a decade later, Oliver, who was, again, Sarah's father-in-law and the founder of Winchester, passed away. He left the company to his son, William. But William, by this time, was also sick, and he died of tuberculosis in 1881. And within the next few years, she lost her sister as well. So she's lost all these people in her life by 1884. And at that time, she was 46 years old, and she left the East Coast to go out to California. She did have other family out there, so it wasn't running away from something, at least from the outside looking in, as much as it was going to something. Her brother-in-law was the president of Mills College in Oakland, and she had two sisters out in the Bay Area. Plus, Sarah had started developing rheumatoid arthritis, so the warmer weather made it easier for her joints to remain loose and really reduce the pain. So moving out there was kind of a no-brainer for her when you add in the medical issues and the family. In 1886, Sarah went on a tour of the Santa Clara Valley, And that's when she came across the two-story, eight-room farmhouse that sat on a 45-acre ranch that was for sale near San Jose. And she would name this new house the Lanada Villa. Sarah and her late husband were very interested in architecture and interior design. After they built a home in Prospect Hill in New Haven, Sarah wanted to expand this mansion to be a place where all of her remaining family could live with her And I mean, that sounds great, right? So she ended up hiring two architects, but then immediately dismissed them both, deciding to do all the planning by herself. Sarah designed rooms one by one, supervised the project, and then took inspiration from the world's fairs that she would visit in her travels. To be clear, she loved architecture, but she was not educated necessarily in architecture. So she was... She had the vision, but wasn't necessarily the expert here. And like we said earlier, she was known to build, tear down, rebuild, and then completely abandon different construction projects if they weren't meeting her expectations. There were wings of her home that she would start building and just be like, ah, let's do something else. And this is what created the maze-like design. So some of it was intentional, but a lot of it was just the result of changing plans and ever-changing blueprints. One newspaper reported that this former farmhouse, now sprawling mansion, was torn down and rebuilt 16 times under the watch of Sarah Winchester. These on-and-off expansion projects also left exterior windows that were now enclosed in interior rooms. There were chandeliers from Germany. She had glass flowing in from Austria, furniture from Asia, and paintings from France, so she very much brought the world to her. The home also had an annunciator, which was an early form of an intercom that was installed for calling servants in large homes, so communication devices throughout the house. There was an indoor garden with slanted floors that helped with drainage and irrigation to uh, to help A, take care of the indoor garden, but also send the water outside to water outdoor plants. That's really cool. It is. It's a really cool design. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. There was a generator that was installed to uh, pump water for electricity. She, she, I, I said she's not an educated designer, but she had a lot of really good ideas and some great things came from her vision for the home. Well, and I think it's, we need to again remember the time frame we're talking about because nowadays, you can have a generator installed for your house and it's, it is a luxury, but it's something that people do right back then. That was like cutting edge technology, right? Incredible. At its largest, the home had 500 rooms. And then as we mentioned earlier, there was the earthquake in 1906 and that caused the seven story tower and most of the chimneys in the home to collapse. So an entire wing and a third and fourth story additions were all destroyed in that So Sarah did have the rubble removed, but then didn't do much work on that section of the house ever again. So that's why there are so many doors that open to nothing where balconies used to be. 
this is a this is an ocean nightmare if this were a business i feel like nowadays this would be condemned like that is not safe <laughs> yeah people I don't know. When people come to your house, you want to show them around. I think she would have had to have them sign waivers if this were to happen today. Like, look, if you fall off a balcony that isn't really there, it's not my fault. Sign away your rights. I mentioned one door that opens up to an eight foot drop that would be over the kitchen sink. And that is not even the tallest drop off inside the house. There's another one that opens to a 15 foot drop into the bushes below. So eight foot drop inside a 15 foot drop on the outside of the house. Like this is legitimately dangerous. Yep. After 1910, while many people claim that Sarah continued working on her house, she actually stepped away and dedicated much of her time to her finances. And there's an author who states, quote, she was far more successful constructing an investment portfolio than a mansion End quote. So her investments proved to make her even more rich. Yeah, so so good for her in that. And she was also kind of expected to be an ambassador during her time there. It said that the president came into town and, and requested to stop by, and she said no at one point. And the vibe was that she didn't want them to see the construction, but I think she was also at this point becoming, even though she was supposedly building the house for more people, kind of a hermit and staying home on her own. She would ultimately pass away on September 5th of 1922 when she was 83 years old, which again is a very long lifespan for somebody at that time in our history. When she died, the Winchester home was a modern marvel with hot showers, central heating, which is again amazing for that time, the generator, the power. Just nine months after Sarah's death, the house was leased to John and Mame Brown. And Sarah's story and legacy started to morph into the folklore that we now have today when we talk about this house. The Browns opened the doors of Lenata Villa to the public as a tourist attraction. So essentially it's a, I know when, when we travel for vacation, there are all these museums of weird and odd things like a Ripley's museum or a wax museum. And that's kind of what this was in order to attract more visitors. They started giving tours and telling stories about Sarah's mental state and how that led to her constructing this marvel. And many people believe that a lot of those stories were made up just to bolster the tour. And that is why today a lot of fact is kind of uh, conflicting with fiction in these stories. The two also started stories about the home being haunted and they invited Harry Houdini out to the house on Halloween of 1924 to investigate the home. And at first he didn't want to, he thought, you know what? I'm, I'm Houdini. I don't have time for this. But then they invited him over for a seance. And after that, he was credited for suggesting the name, the Winchester mystery house, because he was convinced that something supernatural was happening there. How cool is it, dude, that your house was visited by Harry Houdini. Yeah. Wouldn't that be awesome? That would be awesome. I don't know about a seance, but yeah, that's to uh, be like the guy is just, he's a name that's known by everyone. <laughs> absolutely. And it, he was even at that time. That's why they begged him to come over because he, uh, his reputation preceded him a great deal. The work of the Browns and the nature of the small town gossip led to a lot of rumors and embellishment about Sarah Winchester really before and after her death. And there was one rumor about her decision to come to California that was pretty neat. She came to the area to be near family. But one story, which was spread by the 1967 book, Prominent American Ghosts, said that Sarah visited a medium in Boston named Adam Coots, who told her that she and her family were being haunted by the ghosts of people killed by the Winchester rifles, and that she must construct a house for the ghosts, and then she must never complete the project. This 1967 book is often cited by real historians and researchers as the book that turned Sarah Winchester's life from fact to pure fiction. The story about Adam Coons continues to show up in brochures and articles, even though there's really no evidence that she ever visited a medium. And there's no record of a medium named Adam Coots in Boston at that time. So where did Susie Smith, author of Prominent Ghost Stories, come up with these ideas? 
Yeah, some people think that she stitched together uh, some stories from the San Jose Daily News that came in at the late 1800s. And these stories reported that this private woman who owned this massive house that she called Lenata Villa was constantly building because she believed that when there was a completed project that she would die. The superstition came from all of the deaths that she had had in her house from recent years. And that's what resulted in all these mazes and domes and stairways and cupolas that just seemed to serve absolutely no purpose. And she had enough fancy things in there to where this could have been, if constructed properly, like a a castle. We don't have a lot of those in America. Friends of Sarah at the time refuted all of this. But of course, the public took this and ran with it. One news piece said that the sound of the hammer is never hushed. The reason for it is in Miss Winchester's belief that when the house is entirely finished, she will die. And then it ended with whether she had discovered the secret of eternal youth and will live as long as the building material saws and hammers last or is doomed to disappoint as the great Ponce de Leon in his search for the fountain of life is a question for time to solve. And if we're going with the evidence here, obviously she did not live forever. The story was so popular that it was picked up by newspapers around California. This even led to the historic American building survey, the HABS incorrectly saying that the construction lasted 38 years because Sarah believed that it had to continue or she would die. When they added the Winchester home to the National Register of Historic Places in 1981, locals also claimed that Sarah had parties for spirits in her home and that she served food on dishes that were made of pure gold and they kept those in a safe. But after she died, this safe was open and there were no golden plates. There were just personal pieces and sadly there was a lock of her baby's hair. It was also unfair to say that construction was constant and that it never stopped because in one letter that she wrote to a family member, Sarah herself said that she stopped construction during the summer months because it was simply too hot to work. But Sarah was a reclusive widow, so she was naturally a mystical figure in the area and had a lot of rumors spread about her. And after 1900, her health, much like that of her family members, started to decline. She had missing teeth. She had neuritis, which affected her vision and affected her balance. So you think of this woman with this mystery house that's always under construction, kind of stumbling around town with no teeth. And it's going to raise the level of rumors being spread. But at that time, in 1893, during a depression, Sarah and her home made for the perfect villain, a a widow wasting all of her money on a mansion while people were starving to death in the streets. It's like a perfect storm of history and and rumor that, that really built up her story. Some historians believe that one reason for all the construction was Sarah's way to keep people employed and to give back to the community in her way. When she passed away, her employees were named in her will and she left over a million dollars to a hospital in New Haven, Connecticut. And also of note, all of her servants that lived in the house and people who did construction within the home never spoke out about crazy things happening. These all came from the outside, not from the inside of the home. Yeah. Her staff in particular said that that she had no interest in superstition and never saw a seance being held in the house. The home was renovated in 1970s and 80s and became home of the Winchester Rifle Museum. And it became a historical landmark. And the owner, Keith Kittle, played up the mysterious history and superstition in order to draw in more crowds. That makes sense, right? Yeah, it's hard to blame. He's He's got a museum going. You want to draw people in, so... If the stories are already there, you stoke them a little bit for business. That's, I don't think, dishonest or or wrong. I think it's expected. Yeah, visitors and tour guides began telling stories of cold spots in the home, that you could hear footsteps, that at certain times of the day you would smell cooking smells, and other, like hearing odd sounds, you would hear whispers and doors and windows slamming. And this is uh, sensationalizing this house to, like you say, draw a crowd and Guess what crowds do? They pay for entry to this place and then spend more money. I'm sure there's a gift shop. 
And then I think when you go in, if I'm going into a haunted house, I would like to be able to tell a story too. So when I leave, I'm going to be like, yeah, I went in this haunted house and I totally felt a cold spot or I totally heard something like you want to be part of the story as well. So it kind of perpetuated itself. But ultimately, the urban legends of the Winchester Mystery House have survived for over a century. And the stories that you're going to hear show Sarah as a mentally disturbed woman who is obsessed with ghosts and seance and vengeance and was really just trying to make herself survive all these ghosts of the guns that were made by her late husband's company. Truthfully, she was a woman who lived through a lot of tragedy in her life, lost a lot of loved ones. She really loved architecture, and she used that to keep her occupied. She loved designing things, and she worked with carpenters to bring her visions to life. But she was also a perfectionist, so when things weren't going exactly how she wanted, she was very quick. She had the resources to just start over and and redo something that wasn't coming out how she expected. She essentially created a home that could easily be thought of as a haunted house with dead ends and tight turns and hidden hallways. But as Sarah's attorney would say of her, she was as sane and clear-headed as a woman as I've ever known. She had a better grasp of business and financial affairs than most men, which would be insulting to say today, but was a big compliment. That wasn't something people said a lot back then. So a lot of mystery around and, and, you know, I am tempted to believe for this story the most the most basic story that she was a widow who who liked designing things and had the money to do it and people around just started stories. I don't really buy into any of the séance stuff. I think the Browns profited off of this and started it even before she passed away. So uh, I I think there are a number of things you can point into here and, and see as Possible crimes, definitely some fraudulent activity early on, but yeah, I I don't I don't really buy it. But at the same time, if I was in the area, I would love to see this house with hallways leading nowhere and doors to drop offs. I would absolutely go tour this place, but you know, I think at the end of the day, like if you boil all this down, you know, if there was no superstitious component, there was no like. Uh, I guess an agenda to keep building, to drive away spirits. Like the woman was still doing some weird stuff. So was that mental health because of all the loss that she had experienced? Like if it wasn't that, then what, you know, like if it wasn't the, the ghosts and, and that angle, was it other mental health or was it just a woman who had more money than she did ideas or time and just kept building onto this house in an arbitrary nature? Who knows? Yeah, I don't I don't know that one is more likely than another. And I think there was a ton of trauma there to so to say that she was dealing with a lot of mental health issues, I think is is a safe statement, but uh mental health issues, a lot of loss in combination with at the time what had to feel like infinite money and what kind of was. And she made some good financial decisions, so she didn't go completely broke doing this, which especially in depression era, I think is just adds to how impressive her business acumen was. But a mysterious case, nonetheless, I would love to, when I'm out in California, find my way over there. But first, I need to look at a map. Yeah. Guys, this has been True Crime Cast. We appreciate you sticking around. If you want even more content, don't forget that yesterday we uploaded an exclusive episode only available to Patreon members. So you can go check that out. You can visit www.patreon.com. And then when you get there, search for your boys at True Crime Cast. You're going to find almost seven years worth of exclusive content. So don't miss out on that. Yep. We appreciate all of you so much. And again, stay tuned next week for the unveiling of the winners of our review contest for the month, month of March. Yep. Guys, we love you. And until next crime, this has been True Crime Cast. <laughs>